Welcome to this talk on Ayurveda. Ayurveda is something dear to my heart. It's something that I partially grew up with, uh, having lived in India at a young age. Yoga and Ayurveda are very close together. Um, they called sister sciences. And yoga comes from the north of India, from a place called Rishikesh, is what they say. And Ayurveda comes from the south, from Kerala. So you can imagine the people up in the north in the mountains doing yoga up there in the caves and really working on, you know, spiritual enlightenment and transcending uh, up into the heavens from the mountain tops. Whereas Ayurveda was created in Kerala, which is, you know, really lush and green and right by the beach. So people in Kerala wanted to feel good in their bodies. So Ayur means life and Veda is uh, science or knowledge. So Ayurveda can be translated as science of life or life wisdom or knowledge about how to live well, perhaps. So Ayurveda is one of the ho oldest healing systems in the world. We can trace it back about 5,000 years, maybe a little bit more. It's been passed down through generations and were originally documented in ancient Sanskrit, Sanskrit texts known as the Vedas. And um, Ayurveda continues to be practiced and evolves today. It's a living and dynamic medical system with a rich history and tra uh, tradition. And of course, Ayurveda has spread beyond the borders of India, gaining recognition and influence worldwide. And today, it continues to be practiced as a comprehensive system of medicine that offers a holistic approach to well-being through natural remedies, dietary guidelines, lifestyle recommendations, yoga, meditation, and rejuvenation therapies. We're going to go deeper into the practical tools that Ayurveda offers for a harmonious life to promote a balanced and easy living in alignment with nature's rhythms so i'm sure you know a little bit about ayurveda let me see if i can teach you something new today so we're going to talk about the principles of ayurveda there are seven and the first one is that ayurveda is based on the five elements and the five elements are divided into three categories and I do want to say it is important to keep in mind that this is a system that was developed in India where there are three seasons and I'm going to go into this deeper in a moment. But let's start here. So we're starting with space and air. They call this Vata, fire and water, which is Pitta, and then water and earth, which is Kapha. So these are the three alignments or three constitutions made out of the five elements. And we call these the doshas. So as Ayurveda recognizes these five elements in the universe, um, they divided them into these three doshas. And they understand that each human being has all of these elements, of course, but in various um, constitutions. So as a dosha, you can be... Uh, or you can have your primary dosha or your predominant dosha be, for example, vata. Um, what is interesting about Ayurveda as well is these two terms, prakruti and vikruti, when it comes to the doshas. And I will come back to that in a minute. But let's go over the other um, six principles as well. So first off, Agni. Agni is the metabolic fire responsible for digestion and transformation. It governs the assimilation and absorption of nutrients from the food that we eat. To have a balanced Agni inner fire is crucial for everything. <laughs> and if we don't, you know, we don't only have digestive issues and imbalances, but we can also lack that kind of uh, motivation to, to live. The next two, <coughs> excuse me, Datus and Malas. Datus are the seven bodily tissues recognized in Ayurveda. So these are plasma, blood, muscle, fat, bone, marrow, and reproductive tissues. The malas are the waste products, uh, the urine, the feces, and the sweat. And these all need to be properly nourished and eliminated for optimal health. We then go into ahara, which is the food that we eat. And so for Ayurveda, the principle around food is that we choose the right foods for our individual constitution and the season that we're in. 
ahara paka is the digestion and this is where you know mindful eating and assimilating the food in an appropriate way will work for us and then these are the last two, Dinacharya and Rituacharya. And so these are our rituals, or as most people tend to call them, routines. Um, because of my particular flavor of neurodivergent, the word routine uh, gives me issues. <laughs> so I've changed the word, uh, and I will refer to them here as rituals, which hopefully you will agree with me. The Rituacharya does sound like it's... Um, possible to change that word to ritual it makes me feel a lot more uh, connected and spiritual when I say ritual rather than routine but that's just for me so you could call it uh, routine if you prefer so Dina is the day and Charya is a chariot so daily rituals and then the seasonal rituals are the ritual Charya to help us move um, between these different seasons in a way that is good so just some examples then of dinacharya that we get from ayurveda waking up early scraping our tongues doing oil pulling regular exercise meditation and really being focused on uh, getting good sleep so these are pretty basic so then let's go back to these doshas so we have three main ones and if you're simpler in your mind um, then you know one person is kapha, one person is pitta, and one person is vata. If you can go a little bit deeper in your mind, you understand that that is very rarely the case. That, of course, we have all of these elements in our bodies just to different percentages. Each one of us is a unique constitution. So majority of people are actually more sort of, you know, a mixture or a predominance of two doshas. Some people a, are very, very much one doshic. Uh, in predominance and then there are people who are tridoshic meaning they have more or less um, an even spread of all three doshas in their um, constitution and that could sound really nice um, but that means that they have a lot more to balance so the easiest is if you have just one dosha as your dominant because then only really need to work with we don't use the word like lo lowering and higher or raising and lowering in Ayurveda. We talk about pacifying and aggravating. So if you are, for example, predominant in Pitta and Pitta is a lot higher than the other two, then it's a little bit easier for you because then, you know, you only need to work on keeping your Pitta balance and not aggravate it too much and pacify it when you do. Um, but like I say, most people are not that lucky. <laughs> most people are more mixed. <coughs> so this is really the goal to find out um, what is your unique constitution. So let me just give you a really brief overview. So I'm going to start with Vata. Vata people tend to be really tall and skinny. They tend to have a very um, small or slight um, skeleton so that they're, you know, tall and skinny basically like if you think about supermodels that kind of build naturally they tend to be thin and dry and so they have uh, thinner hair thinner skin um, in both senses uh, you know physically the skin but also very sensitive people um, and vata people are emotionally quite sensitive mm, might get you know uh, sensitive to the environment they'll feel pain uh, five minutes before something started hurting that type of thing they are also the most um, spiritually connected often and very very creative artistic people tend to have a lot of vata pitta dosha is in the middle pitta dosha is medium moderate uh, pitta dosha is a mixture of fire and water so these people tend to be more kind of naturally um, poof, you know, like explosive. That's why they need the water there. They're the ones that tend to be more athletic, more sort of muscular, more, uh, you know, built in that way. They can be more competitive. Um, pitta people generally tend to have more um, poofy hair or big hair. Um, not necessarily like that it's thick, but it tends to be more voluminous. Um, pitta people tend to have more yellow-toned teeth. Um, Vata people tend to have more grey toned teeth. 
Um, and Pitta people tend to be uh, competitive and um, are the ones that can get really addicted to a lot of things. So Pitta people will be the ones that are out uh, at nightclubs when they're 45 still. <laughs> These are very rough overviews, okay, so bear with me. Kapha people are sturdy. They're sturdy in their build, they're sturdy and stable in their moods. So whereas Vata people are super sensitive, Pitta people can get explosive, Kapha people are chill easygoing. They tend to be um, heavier set, shorter, um, more, you know, just easygoing. They are the ones that will stay in the same job their entire career. They're very resistant to change. Um, kapha is a mixture of water and earth. So if you have too much of that earth, you end up with mud. So you need to keep it moving so that the water can flow. Kapha people can um, sit on a sofa for way too long. And so they're the ones that need to initiate the most movement. Pitta people naturally move a lot and Vata people basically cannot sit still. So this is a very brief overview, but let's go a little bit deeper and looking at these um, constitutions of the elements in themselves. So Vata is space and air. And I think this is important because you can get these two subtypes in the characteristics of a person as well. So that, you know, like an airhead versus someone who's more spacious. So um, really unbalanced or people who are extreme in their Vata can be difficult to talk to because there's no kind of conclusion to what they're saying and they'll start sentences and not finish and jump from topic to topic but it's this kind of kinetic energy of movement it's the nervous system it's what circulates the blood um, we all move towards vata as we age we become drier and drier <laughs> as we get older and older pitta is a fire and water so this is really uh potential kinetic energy it's the digestion and the metabolism it's the transformation um, it's really the you know strong discerning mind and pitta energy is the sort of mid point in life or you know the, the in between years before we're old and, and uh, after we're, we're really young so this is our time to take action kapha is water and earth and so this is potential energy, this is stability, this is our immune system, this is what supports and holds, and this is the more nurturing, patient, compassionate, and loving. So perhaps as our bodies become more vata as we age, our personalities or our um, mental attitude becomes more kapha, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> so I want to talk to you about the seasons because to understand Ayurveda you need to come out of the four seasons mentality and understand that the Ayurvedic system is based around the seasons in India so as you can see here Vata is the cool season uh, it's the dry season um, what we would call like you know winter and then after the dry season as the sun keeps heating up um, we move into Pitta, which is the hot season. And it just gets hotter and hotter and hotter until the rain starts to fall. And we call this the monsoon season, which is the Kapha season, where everything is green and luscious, but there's a lot of um, water in the air. And I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm recording to you um, sitting outside on the terrace. And it's raining, and it's been raining for three days nonstop. Um, this is very kapha energy and it's the perfect energy to sit here and record this because I really can't leave the house. <laughs> so kapha is the perfect time to sit on the sofa and be creative or do um, work at home. But anyway, so this is the kind of foundation to these three um, doshas. And I think it is important to really understand that and get that in your mind because when we think about the four seasons, it doesn't really align. However, a lot of the recommendations are still useful, but to keep in mind um, the part of the world where this is coming from. Because some of the foods, for example, that are listed might not be local or seasonal during that time for you. So just um, do your best to transcribe and translate into where you are. I also want to talk a little bit about the Ayurvedic clock. 
So let's start with Vata at around 4 a.m. This is when we start to ease up in our sleep. We start to, you know, the digestive system starts to get going again. Um, in a lot of spiritual communities, they'll wake up around 4 a.m. or 4.30 and start to meditate at that time. Um, and again, coming back to, you know, the Indian continent and Southeast Asia, the because we are on the equator, the time stays pretty much constant throughout the 12 months. Um, unlike, you know, for example, Lapland, where I was born, where we have no sun in the winter time and a lot of sun in the summertime. Here, it's pretty much the same. So we have a six hour day. The sun comes up around six and it goes down around six. Um, so when sun comes up in the morning, it's kapha energy. And this is when we want to start moving and, and getting, you know, the potential energy going. Pitta is the hottest hours of the day, of course. Um, and this is where we want to start taking action and doing the heavy lifting. It's also uh, traditional in India to have your heaviest meal around lunchtime and then have a siesta um, or a little sleep. Um, and then in the afternoon, we move into vata until the sun goes down where we move into kapha energy. This is when we want to start winding down. And if we don't wind down and use that kapha energy to relax, we can have a second energy spurst, as you can see, um, around 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. We go into pitta energy again. So if you stay awake past the kapha, you might find it difficult to go to sleep after that. Then the next thing I really want to talk about, which is fundamental to an Ayurvedic dosha uh, understanding, is Prakruti and Vikruti. Now, Prakruti is your inherent, natural and unique constitution, basically your doshic makeup. It's determined at the time of your conception and it will remain relatively stable throughout your life. So these are your physical characteristics, your mental tendencies, and your overall health patterns. So we could say in some way that, you know, Prakriti is your true self or who you are meant to be. Whereas your Vikruti is your current state of imbalance, the deviation from your Prakriti, your doshic disturbance. This can be due to various factors like trauma, lifestyle choices, dietary habits, environmental influences, stress, or even just seasonal changes that we are not moving with, um, which is very easy to do in 2023 where we have a lot of electricity and, you know, generally things just keep going and going. Whereas when you live in nature, um, the change of the season really affects you. So the question for recruitry is, how are you now? Um, and so... Understanding Prakriti and Vikruti is really crucial because it helps us see not just, you know, this idea like health for everybody, but or a general idea of, you know, how we should be, but rather how you are meant to be. So when we compare our Vikruti to our Prakriti, we're able to see where um, we're out of balance. And then an Ayurvedic practitioner can then develop personalized treatment plans to restore that harmony and promote the well-being of the person. When we have a Ayurvedic consultation, generally the first consultation with an Ayurvedic practitioner will be about two hours. And they really in evaluate your Prakriti by looking at your physical characteristics, your personality traits, your behavioral patterns and your history. Um, which helps them understand your inherent strengths and the vulnerabilities with, you know, your doshic makeup. And then they will look at your recruitry, which is, you know, what are your current health symptoms? They'll check your pulse, examine your tongue, etc. And use that to find where you're off kilter from your um, prakruti. So the goal of Ayurveda is balancing our doshas into their natural balance by aligning our recruitry with our prakruti. And we can achieve this through various approaches like dietary adjustments, herbal remedies, lifestyle modifications, detoxification techniques, stress management, yoga, meditation, and other therapeutic interventions. The goal is to address the root cause of the imbalance and support the body's innate healing ability. So from here, I recommend that you do your dosha test. And um, there's a little star here, an asterisk, just to say that these tests are short and brief. And they might not be, you know, 100% accurate. Like I said, if you go to an Ayurvedic practitioner, you will get a much more in-depth 
analysis, but it's a nice place to start and hopefully it triggers some uh, insights for you. So go ahead and do that and then come back and if you're interested, you can watch all three of the doshas or you can just go into and get to know your dominant doshas uh, better by the videos for each one. Okay.